All right. Welcome back to Let the Journey Begin. I am actually your host this week, Alex Meschi, Executive Director of the Red Songbird Foundation. And we're going to do things a little bit different this week. Rather than Jason and Hillary, we decided to do a 70th episode special. So thank you all for watching up to until this point. And I'm actually going to have Ryan join me as my co-host as we interview an amazing guest this week. So Ryan, say hi. I know our viewers can't see you, but we wanted to make sure that you know he's there so that when he chimes in, it doesn't scare you that we're breaking the fourth wall, which is potentially a big no-no, but he is our producer and there are shows that the producers do chime in. So we're going to give him that opportunity this week for his shot at fame. How does that sound? Oh, a shot of fame. I like that. Well, I'm I, as if you guys don't know, I'm always behind the ones and twos, always doing the recording and all that over the last 70 episodes. So you finally get to hear my voice and I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So this will be a, a little bit of an interesting show. And I feel like there's a great message here in that Ryan and I are not in recovery, but we are somewhat familiar with recovery. And I feel that this show could be a great way for us to educate listeners that may not be in recovery of, you know, how uh, someone in recovery got to where they are and turn their life around. And to those that are curious about potentially taking the leap and, you know, maybe you're going to reevaluate your uh, usage habits, um, maybe an interesting way to bring some education to the table. Definitely for me, you know, not being in recovery or anything like that. Um, but over this last 70 episodes, I've definitely learned a lot myself just about the things I do personally, the way I could maybe reach, you know, change things around in my own life and how, how that whole situation goes. So it's always been educational to me. So it's, it's a fun learning process. Yeah. And even if not that we do have a great guest that brings an interesting aspect to recovery through physical fitness. And, uh, we're going to hear his story in just a moment. Uh, but I'd like to introduce him. That. Yeah, I know you are. You're working out at Equinox with those huge legs and quads. Hey, you know, that's something like the one thing I take pride in, right? You know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, nothing wrong with that. If there's <laughs> one thing to take pride in. It is your body, right? Yeah, right. Um, so with, without further ado, I'd love to bring on our guest. His name is Dr. Dimitri Fuchs of Fizz Recovery. Welcome aboard. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we're going to get into a little bit of your story, um, and kind of do this show, uh, one, it's the 70th episode and we're already doing it completely different, but our normal, uh, setup, we would typically ask you, you know, what'd you want to be when you grew up and what happened and really talk about your personal life. But I would also like to carve out some time to really talk about your transformation and how you develop the practice that you're doing. So with that being said, when you were growing up, I mean, before the Wu-Tang tattoo that you told <laughs> us about, what did you want to be when you grew up? So I wanted to be a part of the medical field growing up. But before that, for our first career day, I believe it was in the second grade, I wanted to be a botanist. Mm. So there was a nursery across the street from where I lived and the two gentlemen I owned it were super nice. His name was Leo. I went, I bought a little cactus. I put my mom's lab coat on, so it looked like a dress. <laughs> and I showed up with a little cactus in hand, white lab coat, and I told everybody I was gonna be a botanist. <laughs> and I had no clue what a botanist was. <laughs> and fast forward to, uh, what is that now? About 30 years later, I have quite a bit of plants at home now. Maybe I can get some tips from you because I was gifted an orchid and a succulent. And I know orchids are kind of hard to keep alive. Succulents are not. I killed both. Mm. So I'll definitely get some tips from you after the show. But on that, so you wanted to be a botanist. You were playing dress up, taking your cactus to school. <laughs> and then where to go from there? Life became kind of weird in uh, elementary school when I started to feel like I was becoming self-conscious. I think I thought too much as a kid. And so in about, what was that? Maybe the third grade, the third grade or so, I was watching like the Power Rangers on one TV and then I flipped over it and all of a sudden I saw a Wu-Tang Clan video and it just put my life into a really weird spiral of like, am I this little Russian Jewish kid practicing Russian Jewish things? Or am I this like little hard rap graffiti kid grew up, growing up in LA? And it just made me an, a very eclectic kid. 
But I thought it was pretty cool to have all these different things. And, but academically, I was always into school. I, I find everything interesting. I mean, we could talk about your clipboard for 30 minutes if you want. <laughs> if you could tell me how that clipboard was made, I will sit here and listen because it's just like a 30 minute discovery channel on manufacturing cardboard or something. I find everything interesting. Mm. So school was always fun. But I, was, I think I was overly just like a normal kid. I played sports. Basketball was my thing. Um, Socially, I did well. I, I didn't make enemies very easy. I made friends pretty easy. Mm -hmm. And I just skated by until about the eighth grade when, you know, like a substance was introduced to my timeline. That, that, that yeah, kind of. That was going to be my question. So, we, you know, before we got into this podcast, we chatted a little bit with you and you're 10 years sober. Congratulations. Thank you. Almost eleven, um, but when did when did those substance and why did those substance substances start to get in, come into play? Um, the why, the why is uncertain. Uh, the universe needed me to have an experience, mm. so I had my experience. But it was eighth grade uh, geometry class, Miss Savasova, Bancroft Middle School in Hollywood, and this kid in the back. He he's sober now too, but I I won't put him out there. He uh, he just reached over and he's like, "Yo, you want to smoke this?" And it was this little brown bag of sticks and stems. Mm. And I had no clue what it was. No clue. And I remember I did really well at the D.A.R.E. program. I have a D.A.R.E. tattoo on the back of my thigh, <laughs> uh, back of my calf. I excelled really well in the D.A.R.E. program. But the moment he offered me a sack to smoke, I was like, absolutely. And this kid had Liberty Spikes. Mm. And he was a cool skater kid. I just wanted to be cool. So I said, yeah, let's smoke. And it went from... That one, I want to be included moment to just, okay, well, now I'm in trouble. Because the first time I smoked, I got in trouble. Mm. We, uh, yeah, we took a little m and Minis container, made it into a little pipe, and boom. So talking about the sack of sticks and stems, I'm assuming we're talking about marijuana. Yes, sir. So with that, I mean, you mentioned that you were watching Wu-Tang stuff and flipping through. I know there's a lot of marijuana usage, you know, in rap culture. Yeah. Uh, so how was it that you didn't know what it was if you're watching Wu-Tang stuff or just wasn't paying attention or you thought they were smoking cigarettes because you didn't know better? My guess would be it was probably normalized cigarette smoke or something. Um, Russian family, lots of smokers. Gotcha. You know, it, none of that, lots of drinkers. None, none of that was um, off-putting. And I think I, I really liked the music more so than I knew anything about the culture. Gotcha. It was the beat and it was, it was how hard it was. Mm -hmm. So I gravitated toward that. Okay. So then after you're smoking through these Eminem minis tubes and it was the first <laughs> time, what happened after that? Well, um, the person I was smoking with got caught and his parents found out and they called my parents and that little community cycle started and it got back to my parents. And from that point, it was fun with consequences. So, you know, they kind of discuss the progression of addiction and alcoholism as uh, fun, fun with problems and problems. I started with the second one immediately. It was fun with problems right away. Cause in middle school we had this, I guess it was like a, a rehab counseling program where the bad kids in school, instead of going to English class once a week would go to this little class and we just spoke about it. it it's, it felt, it felt very meeting kind of, um, but it was a teacher in middle school trying to do her best to try to get these kids together and talk. And from then I started to, uh, I think I started to just be intrigued by the lifestyle of it now. Now it was, oh, I have a role here. I have a place in middle school. I'm not just like a weird kid anymore. I belong to a group of people. And that just escalated. And it was a very paralleled experience of doing well academically enjoying it and living this like life of constant illegal actions let's just call it drugs are illegal hanging out doing this is illegal drinking is illegal um you know the more you do it the more you kind of get caught into distributing it here and there by no means am i just like a big drug dealer drug dealer but you know you buy one you split it with somebody and they yeah. see you know you're like selling half of it it's not that's <laughs> right. not the first time we've heard yeah. somebody talk about us on here so yeah. so it just became this like parallel lifestyle of i'm this academic dude um editor-in-chief of yearbook um ap classes and 
now I'm getting in trouble um, legally and, you know, with substances and becoming addicted to the lifestyle. That lifestyle is fun. And it sounds like these two converging lifestyles are running in parallel or whatever. I mean, are uh, perceptually very different. They shouldn't be happening. Someone that's good and with grades and school and stuff shouldn't be getting in trouble with law typically. No. So you mentioned you have almost 11 years. How old are you now? 36. Okay. So we got still a little bit of time between 17 and about 25, 26, Mm -hmm. I would say. What happened in between those years? College, man. Um, You know, high school kids like drugs. You know who likes drugs more? College kids. (laughs) (laughs) So, (laughs) I mean, you're not wrong. Uh, Unfortunately, this uh, uh, last last weekend, there was a music festival in Michigan and a bunch of college kids are uh, turning up, you know, passed away from overdoses and carbon monoxide poisoning. So, I mean, to your point, they like to party and they're going harder than ever, ever since COVID's been lifted. Mm -hmm. Um, So did you see your college usage getting worse and as a result, everything else getting worse? Or how did that all look in, in through your eyes? Yeah, everything got worse because I was exposed to more things. Okay. Um, you know, well, what's that line? Um, experience drives development. And that could be a negative and the positive direction. Mm-hmm. And I experienced a lot of new things. And that just drove to the development of a lot of bad habits. Gotcha. And, you know, Things like Adderall are big in college. Yeah. Never knew about Adderall. Yeah. Um, stronger opioids are a thing because most high school kids don't have the tolerance of 800 milligrams of Oxycontin a day Jeez. yet. You know what I mean? But a college kid that's already in their 20s is now trying harder things. And then that becomes something I get exposed to. And it just is cycled. It, it, it is spiraled into a very, very deadly direction and i felt like every single day i was playing with my freedom more so than my life my freedoms Mm -hmm. because if if you're doing something negative or illegal every single day what again this is like 10 years ago pot wasn't legal yet so every single day i'm doing actions that are technically illegal technically i'm playing with my freedom all day long Mm -hmm. all day long whether i'm driving and smoking smoking and smoking sleeping and smoking or participating in this group of people or that group of people, everything was so, it was, everything was just playing with my freedom and it became very dark. Um, never thought I'd get that far. So what was that uh, turning point? Where did you finally go to get to the point where I got to change things up, got to switch things and get on the right track. And uh, by the way, uh, we had to sep- you know, celebrate this 70th episode with the trees being trimmed outside and the leaves being cut so if you guys in the background can hear any of that that's what it is nobody's you know making <laughs> thank you for the clarification yeah making stuff in the kitchen it's just the tree cutters outside by the time i was 25 i was exhausted of being in trouble mm. and being in trouble is exhausting whether you're in trouble with yourself in trouble with a relationship with trouble with your parents in trouble with your friends in trouble with institutions, Mm. in trouble financially. You're just constantly in trouble. I was so exhausted of it. And I knew there was a better way of living. Some folks, I mean, I don't don't know if everybody knows that there's a better way of living. I was granted the ability to know that there's a better way of living and I was exhausted of being in trouble. So, you know, in May of 2010, uh, my grandmother passed away on my birthday. And that's very significant because she raised me. She's like the the back the, the backdrop on my phone. I shared a room with her my whole life growing up. She passed away on my birthday, and that took my drug addiction into a really bad direction. Mm. And from May to August, it was just really bad. And then in August, I just found myself doing things that completely compromised my morals and values. I was raised to understand better. And I threw everything out the window, everything out the window. I was nodding off at people's funerals. I was getting fired from jobs. I was breaking and entering into places. I was completely out of line. And at some point I woke up and I said, I can't be in any more trouble. I just, I I can't live this lifestyle anymore. It's not the drugs. The drugs are just a part of a lifestyle. I don't want this lifestyle no more. And I asked for help again. Yeah, I caught my dad in the in the hallway and said, "Please help me, please." That wasn't the first time that uh, you reached out for help yet. Um, 
It was the first time I reached out for help in the sense of, please send me away somewhere. Gotcha. I've spoken to my sister about it, like, oh, I need therapy. I've spoken to friends about it, but I've never asked my dad, like in a hallway, begging him for help. And a few days later, I was in treatment. Okay. So if is there a specific thing that you can pinpoint as far as the moment of clarity? Because I mean, most of the guests that we've had on here before don't have that uh, internal realization that this isn't uh, conducive of their ethics, morals, or values. Uh, typically, there's some sort of external factor that helps them get that moment of clarity. Sure. From what I'm hearing, it sounds like you knew it. Now you just needed help getting there. There, there was like a few final things I did that I just generally don't speak about because it, it, it does nothing but, I think, hurt the person I would have to hear it. Mm. But I could paint a picture. And so a few days before I finally got sober and I went to treatment, I woke up at like two in the morning, Jonesin. So Oxycontin was my drug of choice at, that, at the end. Jonesin, so real physical pain, sweating, everything. Within an hour, I am in a... Um, 70, I believe it's a 76 uh, gas station in Van Nuys waiting for the dope man. I am in a pea coat, a top hat. <laughs> I don't remember what my bottoms were, but I had like this <laughs> cool jacket on with this like fly hat. I felt like there was like some prostitutes walking. So I'm talking to them and I'm just standing on this corner waiting for the dope man. And then I get my stuff, I get home, I wake up and I'm like, what the hell just happened last night? A, why was I in that, in that outfit? <laughs> why was I talking to these people? And is this really what I'm about? Wake up, Jones, put on a little Halloween costume, go get your dope and go back to sleep. And that was a visual that I just, I, I didn't want anymore. Yeah, that's definitely, I, I think, a very powerful mindset to really have that self-reflection and see what you're doing and be like, wait a minute, why am I doing this? <laughs> so you went to treatment. Uh, how long were you in treatment for? So one month. And then at one month, they spoke to my family and convinced me to stay another, convinced them to keep me there for another 30. And then at day 60, I asked to stay for another 30. Okay. Um, Cause I wanted it at that point. And then I worked there for eight more months. So I, tend to tell people I went to treatment for 11 months because I participated. I wasn't just driving the druggy buggy and, and, and not going into groups. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's good on you to request the extension. 90 days is much better of a foundation than 30 days, uh, especially when you look at all the statistics. It's it, They're not hard to find. But um, would you say that that has to do with kind of your innate nature of wanting to learn more and figure out how things work? And you mentioned that you wanted to be a physician. This may have been kind of piquing that interest too. It was that kind of hitting the nail on the head for you. I wanted to learn. Okay. I wanted to learn. Um, like I said earlier, I was addicted to the lifestyle, everything about it, the people, the places, the things, the activities, the drug, the lifestyle. I wanted to get good at the lifestyle of recovery. And what that meant was you have to do it all the time. Mm -hmm. You have to be surrounded by it. You have to talk about it. You have to become that annoying person that talks about recovery. Right. It's a part of learning. Learn something and explain it to somebody. That's how you uh, uh, learn something. And I, I wanted to eventually use that to catapult my way back into being a professional. I wasn't sure that I wanted to be a medical professional at that point. I, I didn't know what, because I just graduated with like an economics degree. So I was working at a bank. So I thought I might go back to a bank and that didn't work out. So I was like, all right, well, what am I going to do? So I Google searched most fulfilling careers. And, you know, there was a bunch of lists. And on every list, there were two healthcare professions scattered. One was nursing. One was physical therapy. I had no clue what physical therapy was though. Mm. So, and I knew I didn't want to be a nurse. I think I had the skill set for it, but I didn't want to be a nurse necessarily. So I looked into physical therapy and I realized that, whoa, maybe this is my way of working in recovery. Maybe this is my way of also being a nerd. Again, botany, pre-med, economics, physical therapy, I'm destined to just be a nerd. 
I like learning. So I was like, maybe this is my way in and nobody was doing it. So I started to ask some people like, hey, I remember talking to a couple of treatment center owners. I was like, yo, if I became a physical therapist, like, can I help out somehow? And everybody gave me such encouraging energy. I just had no clue how to make it happen. Mm. But so yeah, so that's where the journey became Google. Thank you. <laughs> right on. That's I, I, I I've mean, done that before too. Google search. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. I, I mean, some people use Google and they put these crazy ideas <laughs> in their, into their head as to, you know, what am I, uh, what kind of malady or, you know, what did I eat or what have you, but it sounds like you actually used it for good, kind of found a purpose and direction. And then, uh, I'm assuming you started applying to programs and things like that, right? Oh yeah. It was, it was, it was a, a learning experience of what rejection from institutions feels like. Mm. Um, it was a different experience. So my academic transcripts were not very good from UCLA. Uh, it's really hard to get good grades when you're strung out. It's just is. And on paper, I don't look too good. And in sobriety, I went to two years of community college to try to raise grades and that looks really good. But mathematically, you can't change six and a half years of grades with a couple of A's. So I started to apply to programs. I'd go to all the open houses, make sure people knew my face. I have no problem extending my hand and speaking to people. And I would just get rejection letter after rejection letter for two years, 16 programs. Um, applying a couple times to some programs. And at some point, somebody gave me a chance when I asked for a, um, what was it? Um, an academic appeal, something like that, where I was like, hey, just please, please take a look at my whole application. What about the community college? What about my personal statement? What about the fact that I told you my grades are not an accurate representation of my skills? And a school gave me a shot. So, and then... That's, that's that story. Chapman University. Right on. Well, kudos to Chapman. I know uh, we've got some connections in there and they've got great programs in psychology mm -hmm. and uh, their cinema programs are Fantastic. great. Fantastic. Yeah. I have a, a question that's more of a personal question and I think some of our listeners may be able to utilize something from it, but in getting those rejections and being fairly new in your recovery, how were you able to be resilient? Because I know there are some people that are not even in recovery or have no you know, previous substance use that they get a rejection letter from their dream college or, you know, even a college that they were just trying to get into, not even the dream college. And it's just sends them into that downward spiral. Great, great question. So I was on my last leg. So I was about to quit all of this. And, um, the, the way I managed it, I think was just having structured a good enough life that kept me moving in the right direction. I was working at Cedar sinai as like a PT aide. I was living at home with my family where I didn't need a I didn't need to cover all my expenses. I had structure that allowed me to experiment. I had structure that allowed me to not get the desired outcomes all the time. But in February of 2015, um, I was, I have an autoimmune issue. I was undiagnosed. I was in a lot of physical pain. I was sitting in the Cedar sinai uh, Orthopedic Spine Institute after work. I was like, yo, can you, somebody please see me? It was just like three floors up. And they're like, yeah, we'll take you. So I'm in pain. I could barely walk. And um, that morning, during morning meditation, I knew that something was going to be different. Something about today, I knew that I was going to be okay. And it was, that was already 16 rejections in a row. Physically, I was not doing well. Uh, but I don't know. I just, I was full of hope. And I'm sitting there, it's 5 p.m. And I get, the, I get the email from Chapman that I was accepted and everything goes away. Every, all, all the hardship of those like two years, all that stuff goes away. It's like when, when you make it or you, when you achieve something, all the struggle that got you there, you forget about it. And you accept that in that moment, you're, you're happy now. So it was, it was hard, but to answer the question more um, directly, I had a lot of structure in my life. I had a good job, I had a good family. I selected good friends at that point. I was four years sober and I had a meditation practice. I had a spiritual practice. I had a group of people I would meet every Friday for two hours for, it was just structure, you know, environment. Environment helped a lot. Okay, I, I love that. I mean, the structure and support sounds like it was key in you maintaining 
uh, one, your sobriety, but two, maintaining your course. I'm sure they were motivating you and they were part of the push, whether they were doing it actively or passively. The fact that you had them kind of behind you in your corner was the reason why you wanted to keep pushing forward. So with all of that in mind, now you're in Chapman, let's say now you graduated. How did you or what did you do from there once you had your doctorate? Uh, so before going into Chapman, I already knew I wanted to work in addiction treatment. I just didn't know how to make that happen. I don't know how to bill for PT. I don't know how to structure a PT company. I don't know how to introduce PT to these facilities. So as a part of my research, um, I had to prove that there was a need for PT first. Um, and that was one of my advisors. He, he put my brakes a little bit. He's like, yo, don't work on interventions yet. You don't know how to help them yet. You have to prove that they need help first. You can't, you can't offer help for people that don't want your help. And so I, I did a, I conducted some research to prove that there was a need. I checked uh, five different facilities. I had like 107 participants just to prove that they have pain, that they're reporting. They have functional limitations because of their pain. Pain is not enough. You have to have the pain limit your function. And then the third thing, they want us there. So uh, I did that research and the moment I got the results I thought I would get, I knew that I was going to start a company with some friends and bring PT into treatment centers. That's amazing. So in the, uh, how long has your, uh, phys, phys recovery and the phys brand been around for, uh, December, 2018, technically. Okay. So you got a few years under your belt. Uh, a curiosity of mine is based on your experience working with clients. What's the most common thing you see as a result of an adverse effect of using? So, so the most common thing I would say is just the, the impairments that come with deconditioning. That, that's the first thing. Um, it's not maybe the sexiest term, but it's just deconditioning. Like, as, like we were talking about earlier, you can't drink yourself into good health and you can't smoke yourself into good health. And it, when, when you've been drinking and smoking for one to 30 years, at some point, the body has deconditioned in a certain way. That could limit, that can just present in, you know, limited mobility, they feel stiff or just constant like muscle soreness or back pain, or they just feel weak or deconditioning. But other than that, I've noticed a lot of balance impairments, a lot of balance impairments. Um, and then I've also noticed some really, really unique presentations that never did I think about, like what whippets do to the body and how you know, certain drugs could just destroy the, the nervous system. Again, it's not coming in flocks. It's not like hundreds of thousands of people that are showing up to these facilities with this stuff. But that's like the stuff that's really gets me. Um, I don't, I don't want to use the, the word excited, but it, it, it highlights the need. Like this person has a very unique presentation. It's more than just some personal training exercise that's needed. Skilled um, PT is what's needed. And... But yeah, it's, and a lot of it is just education that's needed to be offered. You don't, if you don't know how to improve your physical um, health, that will probably be your number one barrier to doing anything. I don't know how to. Yeah, you were telling us uh, off air a little bit beforehand, but maybe for the listeners, what exactly at Phys Recovery are you doing with uh, treatment centers and recovery <laughs> and things along the lines of that? Yeah, so with, with treatment centers, we have kind of like a two-part approach or a three-part approach. So the first one is some facilities that we partnered with, every single person that comes to their facility, every single person that comes to their facility gets a physical therapy evaluation. Not everybody needs it. I get it. Some people are 19, built out of rubber, nothing hurts. But then there's <laughs> everybody else who you ask the question, how are you feeling physically? And then they have a story to tell. We see everybody there. Again, not everybody needs 50 sessions, but everybody at least deserves the opportunity to speak to a PT at admission. Other facilities, I simply, we simply do educational groups. It's called Phys Ed, where it's a lecture style presentation, uh, things on the immune system, chronic pain, just the physical consequences of addiction, lecture, PowerPoint, presenter, clicker style groups. And then the third one is some facilities, it's just the as need basis. So, you know, if they have a, a client that really needs PT because they showed up and they have an amputation or they're still in a wheelchair, 
I'm really proud to know that we are some of the people that they would consider calling. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, that's great stuff. I mean, I, I'm always amazed how many people, it's not that people don't want to, you know, be healthy or try and be healthy. Some people just don't know how to be healthy. So the more education, the better. And that works. Yeah, I think there's a little bit of a dichotomy between not enough education and perhaps the wrong education, especially in health and wellness. There's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of clickbait, BuzzFeed, whatever. Um, and I, I think part of it is one finding a regimen or a program that works for you. You got to have buy-in. You got to have consistency and commitment. Uh, but I love the fact that you're able to go to these treatment facilities and work with individuals that you know, may have had loss of mobility that they never thought they'd get back. They thought, you know, this was a permanent damage from whatever they were doing or what have you, or, you know, potentially let's say, you know, they were strung out on something, got hit by a car or what have you. And now they're having chronic pain and things like that. Uh, but the fact that you're able to make progress and impart positive value on their lives and that education that one, you know, especially in the recovery community, a lot of it is peer to peer. And I guarantee you something that you have taught someone has probably been taught to another without you being present or even in the conversation. So that is a huge testament. And, uh, you know, I commend you for that. It seems like too, like anybody who has a lot of physical ailments, that'll be another motivating factor to maybe turn back to those drugs that, that make everything feel better at that point where you can learn how to not turn to that situation and do something a little more healthy for your body. There's, there's very limited research to um, see how dealing with pain affects people's relapse prevention. But I do have one study I found and what they found is it, it was with alcohol use, but if they, individuals who dealt with their chronic pain within a year of their sobriety had a six uh, times decrease in their relapse. Mm -hmm. That's significant, man. Like That's huge. decreasing it by six times if you deal with your pain within the first year. That doesn't mean on day one you got to start doing push ups and see. <laughs> no, give yourself some time, but you, you have to start the process. And the process could be as simple as let's start with education. Let's start with me giving you a few minimum requirements and asking you if you meet these minimum requirements. And if you don't, let's strive toward those minimum requirements. Um, it's, it's so doable. Okay, so Demetra, going back to your story, uh, as we mentioned earlier, 10 years sober, almost 11 years, besides working in the PT field and all, everything along the lines of that, how do, you, how do you maintain your sobriety? How do you stay sober? And what are the things that really keep you going and motivated in, in this whole journey? It's a great question. So I, I think what I do differently is I do not focus my entire life on avoiding drinking and drugging. I did that for maybe the first few years where I had to really focus on the word abstinence. Now my life is just full of how do I get more good stuff into my life? So now it's just, how do you fill your day with life affirming things? How do you completely give yourself to doing better things? And when you start to structure your day with lots of good things, you get pretty good outcomes. And when you get pretty, when you start making pretty decent decisions in a row, you get pretty good outcomes. You sprinkle in one good decision, you might get a great outcome. And so that's what I really do. It's, it's not so special. It's just, I cut out all the garbage hmm. and now it's full of good and it keeps me sober. But I, I still definitely have a connection to the sober community. I still, um, frequent groups. I still go to facilities. I still speak. I still work in recovery. So all of that is there. But for the most part, I just try to craft my day around good. It's always changing though. Like I'm obsessed with learning morning routines. I'm obsessed with learning evening routines. I'm obsessed with figuring out the right way to eat. So it's constantly changing, but I'm okay with that because it's constantly revolved around doing something good. That's amazing. So on that, uh, what would you say is an action for the day that our listeners could do right now? You know, low effort, high reward, because uh, that's what a lot of people are into, that instant gratification, right? So what can somebody do right now after listening to your episode that you think would better their life? Put an intention behind everything you do, because then life has meaning. Um, it's very simple. Like if you're about to have a conversation with somebody, just tell yourself, why am I having this conversation with that person? And you'll add a layer to that conversation. Why am I going to sleep at night? Oh, 
add a layer to that. Simply put a small intention to everything you do and it creates a layer of depth. Uh, I would like to counter that and say something that has that's lots of effort with lots of reward, push yourself physically as hard as you can, mm. as hard as you can. I mean, to the point of exhaustion, to the point where you're like, I might die. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> I know that. Uh, Ethan signed me up for the Long Beach Marathon in October. So uh, <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> I'm going for it, and I'm probably going to die, but we're going for it. <laughs> I got you. But your, your feet might need me afterwards. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that, and I'm, I may actually be uh, having to hit you up for that. I know we're running out of time here, and I'd love to have you back to talk more about the physical co- uh, connection between physical therapy and recovery. But in the meantime, if people want to find more about you and more about Fizz, uh, the whole Fizz brand, I know it's not just targeted to recovery, but uh, whole physical therapy as a whole, where can they find you? So social media tends to be the easiest one nowadays. So it's at Dimitri Fuchs, uh, D-M-I-T-R-Y-F-O-O-X, or at Fizz Recovery, Fizz as in physical, P-H-Y-S, recovery. So any one of those platforms you can find us at. Uh, we are really good at returning calls and replying to people. So please reach out. Let's make friends. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you for joining us, especially on this big 70th episode. You know, it was a pleasure having you. I hope we can get you on here to pick your brain a bit more. Uh, you seem very bright in this space and even brighter in physical therapy. So thank you for the knowledge that you brought in. I can't wait to see the people that were able to help with your message. I look forward to working more with you guys. Absolutely. Big fan. <laughs>